reasonable deductions from the circumstances proven as a reasonably prudent person would ordinarily draw therefrom. Intent is a mental purpose, aim, or design to perform an act, even though the actor does not necessarily desire the consequences that result. Second, that the defendant inflicted serious bodily injury. Serious bodily injury is injury that creates or causes a permanent or a protracted condition that causes extreme pain. Third, that the alleged victim was a law enforcement officer. Four, that the defendant knew or had reasonable grounds to know that the alleged victim was a law enforcement officer. And fifth, that the alleged victim was in the performance of the alleged victim's duties. Making a traffic stop is a duty. If you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the alleged date, the defendant intentionally assaulted and inflicted serious bodily injury upon the alleged victim, who was a law enforcement officer in the performance of the alleged victim's duties, and the defendant knew or had reasonable grounds to know that the alleged victim was a law enforcement officer, it would be your duty to return a verdict of guilty. If you do not so find or have a reasonable doubt as to one or more of these things, then it would be your duty to return a verdict of not guilty. In case number 13, CRS 68, the defendant has been charged with robbery with a firearm, which is taking and carrying away of the personal property of another from his person or in his presence without his consent by endangering or threatening a person's life with a firearm, the taker knowing that he was not entitled to take the property and intending to deprive another of its use permanently. For you to find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove seven things beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant took property from the person or presence of another. To constitute a taking, the defendant must have the property in his possession or under his control, if only for an instant. There must be a severance of the property from the possession of the other person. Second, that the defendant carried away the property, the slightest movement of the property being sufficient. Third, that the other person did not voluntarily consent to the taking and carrying away of the property. Four, that the defendant knew he was not entitled to take the property. Fifth, that at the time of the taking, the defendant intended to deprive that person of its use permanently. A mere temporary taking under circumstances in which the lawful possessor of the property is likely to regain possession does not satisfy this element. However, a temporary taking can be sufficient to satisfy this element if the property is abandoned under circumstances that both make it unlikely that the lawful possessor will recover the property and shows the taker's indifference to the lawful possessor's rights. Sixth, that the defendant had a firearm in his possession at the time he obtained the property. A .45 caliber handgun is a firearm. And seventh, that the defendant obtained the property by endangering or threatening the life of that person with the firearm. Mere possession of the firearm does not, by itself, constitute endangering or threatening the life of the alleged victim. The defendant must use the firearm in a way that endangers or threatens the life of the alleged victim. When considering the things the state is required to prove, these seven elements of this offense may occur in any order provided they are part of a continuous transaction. If you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the alleged date, the defendant had in his possession a firearm and took and carried away property from the person or presence of a person without his voluntary consent by endangering or threatening his life with the use or threatened use of a firearm, the defendant knowing that he was not entitled to take the property 
and is intending to deprive that person of its use permanently, it would be your duty to return a verdict of guilty of robbery with a firearm. If you do not so find, or if you have a reasonable doubt as to one or more of these things, you will not return a verdict of guilty of robbery with a firearm, but must determine whether the defendant is guilty of common law robbery. Common law robbery is taking and carrying away personal property of another from his person or in his, or in his presence without his consent by violence or by putting him in fear and with the intent to deprive him of its use permanently, the taker knowing that he was not entitled to take it. For you to, to find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove six things beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant took property from the person of another or in his presence. To constitute a taking, the defendant must have the property in his possession or under his control, if only for an instant. There must be a severance of the property from the possession, possession of the other person. Second, that the defendant carried away the property, the slightest movement of the property being sufficient. Third, that the other person did not voluntarily consent to the taking and carrying away of the property. Fourth, that at that time, the defendant intended to deprive him of its use permanently. A mere temporary taking under circumstances in which the unlawful, in, in which the lawful possessor of the property is likely to regain possession does not satisfy this element. However, a temporary taking can be sufficient to satisfy this element if the property is abandoned under circumstances that both make it unlikely that the lawful possessor will recover the property and shows the taker's indifference to the lawful possessor's rights. Fifth, that the defendant knew he was not entitled to take the property. And sixth, that the taking was by violence or by putting the person in fear. If you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the alleged date, the defendant took and carried away property from the person or presence of a person without his voluntary consent, by violence, or by putting that person in fear. The defendant, knowing that he was not entitled to take it, and intending at that time to deprive the person of its use permanently, it would be your duty to return a verdict of guilty of common law robbery. If you do not so find or have a reasonable doubt as to one or more of these things, you will not return a verdict of guilty of common law robbery, but must determine whether the defendant is guilty of felonious larceny from the person. For you to find the defendant guilty of felonious larceny from the person, the state must prove five things beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant took property of another from the person of the alleged victim. Second, that the defendant carried away the property, the slightest movement of the property being sufficient. Third, that the alleged victim did not consent to the taking and carrying away of the property. Fourth, that at the time the defendant intended to deprive the victim of its use permanently. A mere temporary taking under circumstances in which the lawful possessor of the property is likely to regain possession does not satisfy this element. However, a temporary taking can be sufficient to satisfy this element if the property is abandoned under circumstances that both make it unlikely that the lawful possessor will recover the property and shows the taker's indifference to the lawful possessor's rights. And fifth, that the defendant knew he was not entitled to take the property. If you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the alleged date, the defendant took and carried away the property of another from the person of the alleged victim without the alleged victim's consent, the defendant knowing that the defendant was not entitled to take it and intending at that time to deprive the alleged victim of its use permanently, it would be your duty to return a verdict of guilty of felonious larceny from the person. 
if you do not so find or have a reason about as to one or more of these things, it would be your duty to return a verdict of not guilty. In case number 13, CRS 69, the defendant has been charged with assault with a firearm on a law enforcement officer. For you to find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove five things beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant assaulted the alleged victim by intentionally pointing a firearm at the alleged victim. An assault is an overt act or attempt or the unequivocal appearance of an attempt with force and violence to do some immediate physical injury to the person of another which show of force or menace of violence must be sufficient to put a person of reasonable firmness in fear of immediate bodily harm. Intent is a mental attitude seldom proved by direct evidence. It must be ordinarily proved by circumstances from which it may be inferred. You arrive at the intent of a person by such just and reasonable deductions from the circumstances proven as a reasonably prudent person would ordinarily draw therefrom. Intent is a mental purpose, aim, or design to perform an act, even though the actor does not necessarily desire the consequences that result. <clears throat> Second, that the assault was committed with a firearm. A 45 caliber handgun is a firearm. Third, that the alleged victim was a law enforcement officer. <clears throat> Four, that the defendant knew or had reasonable grounds to know that the alleged victim was a law enforcement officer. And fifth, that the alleged victim was in the performance of his duties. Conducting a traffic stop is a duty. So I charge that if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the alleged day, the defendant intentionally assaulted the alleged victim with a firearm by pointing such firearm at the alleged victim, and that the alleged victim was a law enforcement officer in the performance of his duties, and the defendant knew or had reasonable grounds to know that the alleged victim was a law enforcement officer, it would be your duty to return a verdict of guilty. If, however, you do not so find or have a reasonable doubt as to one or more of, the, of these things, it would be your duty to return a verdict of not guilty. In case number 13, CRS 70, the defendant has been charged with assault with a firearm on a law enforcement officer. For you to find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove five things beyond the reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant assaulted the alleged victim by intentionally trying to take the alleged victim's service weapon from him, thereby shooting the alleged victim in the leg. An assault is an intentional application of force, however slight, directly or indirectly, to the body of another person without that person's consent. Intent is a mental attitude seldom provable by direct evidence. It must ordinarily be proved by circumstances from which it may be inferred. You arrive at the intent of a person by such just and reasonable deductions from the circumstances proven as a reasonably prudent person would ordinarily draw therefrom. Intent is a mental purpose, aim, or design to perform an act, even though the actor does not necessarily desire the consequences that result. Second, that the assault was committed with a firearm. A 45 caliber handgun is a firearm. Third, the alleged victim was a law enforcement officer. Fourth, that the defendant knew or had reasonable grounds to know that the alleged victim was a law enforcement officer. And fifth, that the alleged victim was in the performance of his duties. Conducting a traffic stop is a duty. So I charge that if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that on or about the alleged date, the defendant intentionally assaulted with a firearm the alleged victim by trying to take the alleged victim's handgun from him, thereby shooting the alleged victim in the leg, that the alleged victim was a law enforcement officer in the performance of his duties, and the defendant knew or had reasonable grounds to know that the alleged victim was a law enforcement officer, it would be your duty to return a verdict of guilty. However, 
if you do not so find or have a reasonable doubt as to one or more of these things, it would be your duty to return a verdict of not guilty. Members of the jury, you have heard the evidence and the arguments of counsel. If your recollection of the evidence differs from that of the attorneys, you are to rely solely upon your recollection. Your duty is to remember the evidence for the call to your attention or not. You should consider all the evidence, the arguments, contentions, and positions urged by the attorneys, and any other contention that arises from the evidence. The law requires that the presiding judge be impartial. You should not infer anything from anything I have done or said that the evidence is to be believed or disbelieved, that a fact has been proved, or what your findings ought to be. It is your duty to find the facts and to render a verdict reflecting the truth. All 12 of you must agree to your verdict. You cannot reach a verdict by majority vote. When you have agreed upon unanimous verdicts as to each charge, your four persons should so indicate on the verdict form. Now, we're at that point um, where I need to inquire of the original 12 seated jurors. Is there anything going on um, that would prevent you from completing your service at this point that I need to know about? The reason I'm asking that is obvious, that if um, the original 12 jurors are in a position to complete their service and begin jury deliberations, it is that time to excuse the three alternates. With our thanks for taking time and making the effort to be here and uh, addressing your civic responsibility to be a juror. You're welcome to stay, but you will be free to leave. Um, if you'll just leave your pads with uh, the sheriff and your jury badge with the sheriff, you can hold on to the jury instructions right there, if you wish, or you can give those to the sheriff and we'll dispose of them. But the three alternates with our thanks as to the 12 jurors remaining for reaching the jury room, your first order of business is to select your corpus. You may begin your deliberations when the data delivers the verdict form to you. Holding an envelope which has the verdict forms inside. You'll be able, the verdict forms each have a number, a case number, written at the top so that you can match up the case number with the instruction that has a uh, similar had the same uh, case number attached to it. Um, so that's one, particularly there's one charge, there's one charge that's this, it, the same generic charge, generically, but it has different you know, elements that have to be proved as reflected in here. But having the number of the case will help you separate. Remember, these cases are to be considered completely separate and independent. One decision does not rely on the other decision. You make your decision in each case as to that case before you move on to the next case. Um, so I want to make sure you're aware of that. When you go in and select your jury form, that's all you do right now. Do not form, do not express an opinion, do not talk about this case uh, amongst yourself. Nothing about it until the bailiff gives you these forms. The signal I was telling you that you would know is when you get this envelope laid on that table, it will be time for you to deliver it. And you can speak anything you want to, you can share your notes, you can do anything you want to uh, in that regard to conduct your deliberations. Uh, in just a moment, when the sheriff comes back, we're going to let you get to the jury room to uh, 
commence your deliberation. Um, commence your selection of a full person. All right, Sheriff, here in your uh, guard. Thank you very much, Jim. Ladies and gentlemen, you may retire to select your full person. All right, before the uh, jury uh, deliver the verdict sheets and jury begins its deliberations, I'll consider requests for corrections or additions to the instructions and other matters you deem appropriate. And of course, uh, we've already objected to the prior things, so I'm not going to repeat that. As to flight, the defendant denies the flight, and we objected to the flight instruction. So just that is correct. And make sure the record's clear on that, and keep this made even clearer. Thank, Thank you. you. Nothing from the state. Right, thank you. Just, in just a moment, then I'm going to, uh, when the sheriff comes back, I'll give the. We have the five separate verdict sheets that, um, just so the record reflects, uh, prior to uh, Mr. Charms. Finney, uh, concluding his uh, summations to the jury before the jury was in, uh, I gave each um, attorney a uh, copy of the uh, proposed instructions and and the uh, proposed verdict sheets. We did have a discussion about that one charge, I think it's assault by a firearm from a law enforcement officer. It's the same charge, but one's for pointing and one is for um, um, allegedly taking the weapon. Uh, one's allegedly pointing and one's allegedly taking the weapon resulting in the infliction of the uh, um, wound, gunshot wound. Uh, we did discuss the, the how to make sure they're separated. The way I chose, so that's on the record, is that my jury instructions, of which I gave each juror individually, uh, an individual written version <coughs> matches up with the same number that's on the verdict sheet so that those things can be matched up. I, uh, I indicated to counsel that I didn't want to go into a description that might, um, I, I recognize that that's an issue, but I didn't want to go into a description that might leave the jury thinking one way or the other uh, about it. Um, and so I chose instead to use the numbers uh, on the, uh, the cases in the jury, uh, verdict sheets, as well as in the instructions. And each juror took their instructions, as I see. All right. Thank you. All right. This time I'm going to um, give the uh, given it the verdict sheets to the table for just taking and laying it on the table and the jury we're at ease, we're in sort of semi-session here. <coughs> 
Um, so everybody remember that's still in the courtroom, but um, I think we can be a little for a few times. Could I ask a question, a procedural question? I served that uh, subpoena on Deputy Chief <coughs> because he was in the courtroom. And I put 2.30 tomorrow as the time just to give them some time to complete it. And if there were to be a conviction, um, I would want that, those materials sealed up for purposes of appellate review, which is the purpose of doing it after the fact. So um, I, I don't know what, how your honor wants to handle that, but it's, it's for purposes of appellate review just to- Well, it, certainly you time to a proper. Yes, um, well, and that's what it would be. And uh, the question deals with the timing aspects of it. Yes. We'll see how the jury, what the jury situation is. Um, as to whether they're still deliberating or whether they concluded it. Then we'll try to do some coordination, find out where we are from the, uh, on the subpoena as to whether it's going to be some sort of motion to quash or whether it's going to be a uh, um, compliance or it's not enough time. The main thing is to make sure that, um, depending on what the jury's you know, decision is, the main thing is to make sure that you have a, a uh, complete record on that. Yes, sir. Thank you. I just wanted to. We'll, we'll be at ease, um, share it until uh, we we'll see what the jury says. What time do the jury go out? Three, three, two, three, two.